For more on the detention of Huawei's top financial executive, I'm joined now by Ron Allman. He's a partner and vice president at the Wix Group and has written extensively on international affairs. So this is still happening, but how common is it for governments to um, arrest or detain high-level company executives? Is this something that is fairly common, and is this just the beginning when it comes to the U.S. and China? Because obviously there could be concerns. We could see some tit-for-tat here. Well, I mean, imagine if the CEO or the CFO of AT&T were traveling via Hong Kong and were arrested uh, and then you know, potentially subject to trial. Um, and it's not something you see every day. Uh, certainly, uh, this type of extradition proceeding and the fact that, uh, that the CFO of Huawei was uh, detained in Canada it was a, a significant moment and it certainly would have involved uh, people at the highest levels of the Department of Justice uh, here in the United States. That being said, um, there has been a lot said of the timing of all this happening when President Donald Trump was meeting with President Xi Jinping in Argentina. Is this move political? And would the Justice Department even let the president know that this was something that was taking place? Because as Toby mentioned, this has been in the works for quite some time. Yeah, I, you know, I'm inclined to take uh, Mr. Bolton, the, the national security advisor, at his word in saying that, that President Trump wasn't given prior notices. And it's true that the Justice Department uh, here in the United States operates independently in a lot of ways, and prosecutors, and certainly a judge in New York is not going to answer uh, to President Trump in, in a, a signing off an arrest warrant. Uh, that being said, there's there's some coordination uh, that has to be involved, certainly with the U.S. Embassy in Canada. And I see, the extradition, extradition process is a very formal process. It involves a, a, the bilateral treaty between the United States and Canada. That goes back to 1971. There was a 1988 protocol that updated that. But this pro these t things don't just fall out of bed and it makes it happen. These You have to work towards this. There's coordination between the State Department, the Department of Justice, of course, their counterparts uh, in Canada. And when we're talking about extradition, I mean, this is a process that could take months. I mean, what what is the process here? She's in a bail hearing, and then what? Well, it's important when you think about extradition. What is it? Uh, it's essentially a quasi-judicial executive function. And it's governed by a treaty. And then also there's an act in Canada called uh, the Extradition Act. It goes back to 1999, it recently reformed. Uh, under that, it's basically two parts. First, it's a, there's a judicial function in which we're seeing today that the bail hearing in which determining if she's a, a flight risk and whether money could, where she could be free until her other hearing, which is called a committal hearing. Basically, the judge will decide whether, there, whether the evidence is sufficient and available and, and the United States has followed the protocol uh, in the treaty uh, in its request for extradition. Now, following that, the Minister of Justice within Canada can make a determination. He almost has unfettered discretion uh, to make some of these decisions, uh, and it can, in fact, override the court uh, on, on a determination uh, as to whether the extradition is proper. And can she fight extradition? I mean, what are her options at this point? That's a great question. So uh, Canada gets about 100 requests, uh, extradition requests a year. Uh, and most of them uh, overwhelmingly are approved. I think only between 1999 and 2014, only five requests were denied out of 1,500. So this is pretty routine in terms of kind of rubber stamping this. In fact, the Canadian process has been criticized uh, in terms of extradition in regards to civil liberties folks because they feel like it's not strenuous enough. Uh, and the United States, uh, unsurprisingly, given its geo, its, its proximity and its relationship with Canada, it accounts for 90% of the extradition requests. Uh, but there are options uh, potentially for her to appeal uh, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. But a lot of it goes back to the Minister of Justice. And what are the grounds? What, what, what are the ways she can challenge it? So you can challenge the fact that the evidence is not sufficient. Um, although it's a pretty low evidentiary bar. The, again, this is not a criminal proceeding in, in Canada. It's a proceeding to determine whether the treaty is being followed and whether, and, and that's, some of that is just like, was, was it a proper arrest warrant issued by the judge in Canada, and excuse me, in New York? Uh, is, there, is it a crime in Canada the, that, that, that there's a reciprocity notion? So the crimes that are alleged in the United States, is, is it also a crime in Canada? Uh, and, and some of these questions will come up. We'll have to see how this all ends. Ron Solomon, great to hear from your thoughts. Thank you.